Well, today is a culmination and completion of this past week, which is unusual. Normally, Sunday kicks off the week to come, and in this case, it's completing this past week. So let's take a look at the big picture here over this last week, because today's gospel is a repeat of yesterday's gospel. And why is that? Well, it's because we've just had an Ember Week, and Ember Saturday, generally, the gospel is the gospel of the following day, which is Sunday. And that goes back to uh, a historical situation where the uh, ordinations of priests would always happen on an Ember Saturday, and it was done late at night, kind of like the Easter Vigil, and there was a vigil of prayers and chants, and early in the morning, perhaps at midnight, uh, the ordination of priests happened. And so the, it was the gospel of the Sunday, but it was begun on the Saturday. And then at a later period of time, the Ember Saturday Mass was moved to Saturday morning. But the gospel was the same, was the same as Sunday. So as uh, as Father Pius Parsh points out in his work on the liturgical year, uh, this is an a-liturgical day where the texts of this Mass and the Gospel are brought together from texts earlier in the week. Uh, so, that's the situation with today's Mass. So let's take a look at, at an outline that Father Parsh gives for this, this past week. Will give us a big picture on today's gospel and, well, on the liturgy for this time period. So let's take a look again at the first Sunday of Lent, which was last Sunday. And on the first Sunday of Lent, Christ fasts for 40 days, then he is tempted, and then he is served by angels. Then we look at this last Wednesday, which is Ember Wednesday. On Ember Wednesday, we have Moses on Mount Sinai and Elias, also known as Elijah, Elias in the desert, who, who in both cases, they fast for 40 days. And the former, Moses, receives the law, the tablets on stone, the Ten Commandments. And the latter, Elias, then reaches the mountain of God. Then we look at yesterday, which is Ember Saturday, and we have Christ and Moses and Elias who appear together on the mountain of transfiguration. So we have something that begins and ends uh, this past week. So there's a relation between these three, and then let's take another look at these three days. So we look at the first Sunday of Lent, and Christ says, you shall serve God alone. And then on Ember Wednesday, Christ says, Whoever does the will of my father is my brother and sister and mother. And then on Ember Saturday, and again today, we have the voice of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. We have a relation between these have our focus on serving God and that he who serves God and we understand that by baptism we are adopted by God as a son or a daughter, son in the son who is Christ, who is Jesus and so therefore we are his brother or his sister or his mother if we do his will and we also recognize then that he is the beloved son, and we need to listen to him. So there's a familial or a familial relationship here. And then what can we learn from this arrangement? Well, Father Parsh points out four points. First, that Christ, Moses, and Elias fasted for 40 days. And we talked about this last week, that we also are called upon to fast for 40 days. And St. Gregory the Great pointed out that this is a time tithe of the year, a tithe or a tenth of the year which we are offering to God by our fasting one-tenth of the year. So 
So Christ, Moses, and Elias fasted 40 days. Secondly, then, this fasting prepares one for temptation, in the case of Christ. It pre fasting prepares one for association with God, as in the case of Moses. And fasting prepares one for wandering in the desert, in the case of Elias. This is not a, this is not a random wandering about. This is wandering in the desert with a particular goal, which is the mountain of God, where he is heading. And so it is with us as well that our fasting is not aimless. We, we aren't fasting wondering when it, will, when it will end. We're fasting with a particular goal, which is Easter. So we have a, we have a set amount of time where we're doing this. Now, of course, the religious of the church and, and monks in particular are encouraged to fast as often as possible. And, and they can even fast when we wouldn't consider fasting. And to love fasting. So we're asked to fast for a particular time period. But at the same time, we should have a love for fasting. We should have a love for penance. I mean, after all, maybe you don't look forward to Lent. But I know many people do look forward to Lent because we need to do penance and actually we're happiest when we're doing penance. We're happiest when we're doing penance. Oh sure, you think about those things you, you aren't doing or that you can't have and you might think about those, but you're actually more at peace. Well, the third point here is the common factor between Christ and Moses and Elias that they are serving God. Now keep in mind that in his humanity, our Lord in, in his humanity is still one person with his divinity, and yet in his humanity he is serving his divinity. So he's serving, so he's serving God, but it's not another person. He's the same, he's one person, but within his one person he has humanity and divinity. So his humanity is serving his own divinity. And so that should clear up any confusion on that. So that our Lord Jesus Christ is serving God, and Moses and Elias are serving God by means of their fasting. But the goal then, which is the fourth point that Father Parsh makes, the fourth point, the goal is transfiguration. Our Lord is transfigured. So he shows us the glory of his resurrected body ahead of time before he has died, before he has been buried, before he has risen again, we're seeing the glory of a tra the transfiguration, the glory of his resurrected body. And this is, this is our goal. This should be our goal. So we have here a theology of fasting. Fasting is one great means by which Christians can prepare themselves to meet the difficulties of life. And let's face it, the Christian life is difficult. The Christian life is difficult. It presents us many, uh, many challenges, many challenges, many temptations. And we uh, are truly wandering in the desert, but we're not wanderous, wandering aimlessly. Maybe that word wandering makes us think of wandering aimlessly. But we're not wandering aimlessly, but perhaps the word wandering is good because as we are heading toward the goal, we're not, we're not entirely sure the twists and turns that God will take us on. And so in a, in a way we're wandering, but we know where we're going. And we have a general roadmap for getting there, but there might be detours along the way that God has in mind for us. God has in mind the detours along the way, and they are for the sake of our salvation. We don't know, we, we don't always understand, well, why am I on this detour, or I thought I was going over there, why am I heading this way? We're not talking about sin here, I'm not talking about heading towards sin, but sometimes, you know, you think you're supposed to be in Idaho, and you end up in Montana. Or you think you're supposed to flee Portland and you end up buying a great property in Portland. Well, all right. God has his way. 
we are not always exactly sure how he's doing this, but we need to trust in him, and we need to persevere, we need to keep fasting and wandering with the goal in mind, which in today's gospel, the goal is transfiguration. Well, transfiguration may not seem like an appropriate theme for Lent, because we're looking at the transfigured, glorified body of the Lord, it seems to indicate resurrection, it seems to be more appropriate to Easter. So why are we looking at this in terms of Lent? Well, that's why we look at today as a completion of last week. It's not the completion of Lent, but it's a, a little package where the fasting, uh, the fasting and the penance is with a goal in mind, so we're looking at the goal now, which is what we will come to at Easter. And now we have to continue to persevere because it is just a momentary image. And then our Lord brings Peter, James, and John down the mountain and tells them not to, not to tell anyone until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So he's giving them a foretaste before the fact, and we are receiving a foretaste before the fact. Now, there was another point I was going to make. What was that other point I was going to make? Let's see here. Um, well, I don't remember. So, you're being spared a few minutes off the sermon, I'm sure. St. Bonaventure makes a point of relating this uh, gospel to our Lenten discipline, and he speaks about the affectionate elevation of the disciples who are chosen ahead of time by God to be shown the transfiguration. So an affectionate elevation. In other words, we are, we are not ascending the mountain ourselves, but in our affections we are ascending the mountain. We are being brought up to see something from the larger point of view. So now consider if you were in the choir you would be at eye level with the 12 apostles up there, and you'd be looking out at the whole church from a different perspective. Think about also if you're out hiking in the gorge or climbing Mount Hood, and you look out and you see the valley below, and you see all this beautiful scenery. Well, now the Mount of Transfiguration is quite high up. And it's a windy, narrow road that gets up there, and you can't even, you can't drive to the top. You have to park at a parking lot below, and then you have to take a shuttle to the top. Only certain people can drive up there. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a harrowing ride, especially coming down really fast in a taxi cab or in a shuttle, really fast on a windy road, and you're thankful if another car is on the way up then you have to stop. Or you're thankful if a little car is in front of you and they're going really slow and the shuttle has to slow down and you can breathe easy. It's a little terrifying, which is appropriate. It's appropriate because the Christian life has its terrors. Certainly in the Christian life, we, are, we, are, uh, we experience a certain amount of terror here and there. And that is our share in the cross. But if we if we consider then to look at the big picture of Lent, you know, we're looking back at this last week, kind of putting it all together. But let us also uh, let us also affectionately ascend, so we can look at the big picture of Lent and our own Lenten penances. Because while we are doing penance and we're fasting and we're abstaining. You know, maybe all you can think of is, is candy. Maybe it's just all you can think of. You've given up candy. You wouldn't be eating candy anyway, but since you've given up candy, it's all you can think of. And so uh, that's not such a bad thing, you know, thinking of candy. It's a distraction. There are better things you could be thinking of, but there are worse things you could be thinking of. So let's say that you had not given up candy and you were enjoying all the candy you wanted. 
Well, if you were enjoying all the candy you wanted, you'd be thinking of other things. You wouldn't be thinking about candy. You wouldn't need to think about candy. I hope I'm not making anybody hungry here. We're not serving candy at Coffee and Donuts. But even so, if you're eating as much candy as you want, you're really not thinking about candy. We could use another example. Let's say that you're, let's say that you're fasting. And throughout the day, you can't wait for your one meal. So all you can think of is, what am I going to have for my one meal? Oh, I can't wait for that one meal. All right. Well, but let's say that you're otherwise um, gluttonous. And you um, eat the finest of foods, the most delicious, the most fashionable of foods. You eat in the nicest of restaurants, and you enjoy all of that. Well, that... <coughs> That, uh, we would call gluttony an incomplete sin, because gluttony tends to lead to other indulgences of the flesh. And indulgences of the flesh are introduced by first gluttony, and then drunkenness, or first gluttony, and then other sinful indulgences. So when you're not fasting, it's more likely that you're going to be focusing on sinful things. Whereas if you're fasting, you're thinking about food and not those other sinful things. See what I'm saying here? We're distracting ourselves by thinking about just sort of normal things that aren't sinful. Food is not sinful. And if all you can think about is that candy bar, or if all that you can think about is what you're going to eat for your one meal today, that's a good distraction. It's a better distraction than the other thing. And so it is then you distract yourself with doing good works. You distract yourself with giving alms. Well, how am I going to give alms today? Uh, or you distract yourself with the prayer that you're taking on during Lent. And you see, these things keep you busy. A monk, for instance, is busy. He doesn't have time to sin because he's too busy. He has too many things he has to accomplish in the day. And you might think that a monk is just sitting around listening to a Gregorian chant and, and writing in the scriptorium. But it, uh, pursuing holiness, pursuing sainthood is a very busy life. The idea of Lent is we are busying ourselves with things that are holy, fasting, good works, almsgiving, prayer, etc. So that you don't have time to be thinking about those things that normally would tempt you into sin. And that's the big picture. When you're at the top of Mount, uh, Mount of Transfiguration, you're looking out at the Holy Land, and it's, it's an expanse of, of, of land. So now when you're, when you're involved in your penances and all you can think about is candy, or all you can think about is your next meal, well then you're not seeing the big picture. Why are you fasting? Why are you doing good works? Why are you praying? If you go up to the, if you go up to the choir loft, and don't go up there because the choir needs to be left alone. If you go up to the top, you know, to the top of a mountain and you look out, well, you're, you're given perspective on your whole life. And you're not involved in the day-to-day. -day. You can look out at your whole life and you can think, uh, you can think about uh, the, the big picture. And the big picture is that we're doing, we're observing this land for the sake of our last end which we, we prepare to have a holy death. We prepare uh, for a holy death so that on the last day, when our bodies are resurrected from the dust from which we have returned, from which we have come and to which we will return, that our bodies will be transfigured and glorified and beautiful. And that needs to be our goal. Our goal should not be one of fear. We're not fasting out of fear. We're fasting out of love. 
But we also realize that we're obliged to do penance. Because if we weren't obliged to do penance, we wouldn't do it. Sometimes we need to be told what to do. You need to do penance. And then you do it. And you're actually happy. Lent is maybe the happiest time of the year. Does chocolate make you happy? Does eating three meals a day make you happy? Well, maybe it does. But look at the big picture, and if you are stuck just looking at all the penances you're doing, step back and realize why you're doing them. It is for this greater good, for the end of our lives, for the end, really, of all things, which will be uh, the resurrection of our bodies. And we will either be resurrected to holiness, or we'll be resurrected to the other thing, eternal, eternal damnation. I don't even really want to speak about that. Well then, I wish you a very blessed Lent. Persevere in your penances, persevere in your fasting, and have your eyes on the transfiguration, on the glory of Christ, future glory that is promised to you if you stay close to the Lord, if you follow his commandments, if you are humble and, and don't give up, don't give up, don't be discouraged. Amen.